Good evening and welcome to the curriculum subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee, Tuesday, November 10th of 2020 at 5.30 p.m. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency on March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A section 20 pursuant to, the, to that order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the open meeting laws requirement that meetings be held in public places at open and physically accessible to the public so long as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held uh, and will be accessible to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube, and Comcast Channel 98. Uh, the public can also access this meeting via the following link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton channels. All right, so first thing we need to do is a roll call to establish a quorum. Um, Mayor Sullivan. Yes. All right, and I am also a yes. Um, Ms. Asak. Yes. Ms. Mrs. Mendez. Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Okay, we have established a quorum. Um, so our Agenda for the evening, uh, we have the presentation of the school-based strategic and school uh, improvement plan uh, from the Gilmore Elementary School, and uh, finally, any other business that needs to come before the uh, curriculum subcommittee. I see we have um, Mary Beth O'Brien, the principal at the Gilmore with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I didn't know if the superintendent wanted to comment before they started with the presentation for the evening. Yeah, thank you, Mr. DiAugustino. Um, so um, the Gilmore, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, the Gilmore School is um, with us tonight, Principal O'Brien, um, June Sabra McGuire is also with us. Um, last, last week we had South Middle School, or could have been two weeks ago now. We had South Middle School um, present last week along with the Brookfield Elementary School, uh, who also have school-based strategic improvement plans. So um, this is part of our series that all our schools, 11 schools that, that have worked, uh, um, put a lot of hard work in with their teams and with members um, from the Department of Education on their strategic improvement plan. So tonight um, we have the pleasure of having uh, Principal O'Brien with us to go over her plan. And obviously June can jump in um, with anything more she wants to add before Mary Beth stops her presentation. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I just want to thank Mary Beth and Heather. Heather Ronan's also with us tonight. Heather is the district liaison to the Gilmore in helping to support them in developing their plan. And as you know from the Brookfield and South presentations, there are similarities that you're going to hear in all of the plans that are specific to the four turnaround practices but you'll also hear the way each school has adapted these practices to represent the unique needs of their individual schools. As you know, the Gilmore is also an ELT school though, and so they have an additional layer that I'm sure that Principal O'Brien, Mary Beth, and Heather will address as they highlight what are the most important features of the Gilmore Sustainable Improvement Plan and so I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Beth. I know she has a, a presentation that I'm going to be sharing with you. So are you ready to go? I am, let me share my screen. Let's give it one second. Did it pop up in presentation mode for you? Yes, it did. Okay. It's not in the single slide. It's on presentation, full presentation. No, it's, on single, it's on single slide, Mary Beth. Okay. Thank you. I'm on my one computer. So I'm just, um, as opposed to 
my double screen so it might not let me do both. Sorry for the delay. No worries. How about now? There you go. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Thomas, Mayor Sullivan, members of the school committee, members of the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, thank you for inviting me here today to share with you the story of the Gilmore on behalf of the de dedicated teachers, families, and students of the Gilmore School. Uh, uh, hopefully tonight, I'll be able to provide some context uh, for a glimpse of the work around sustainable improvement at the Gilmore. It's important to note that the Gilmore Elementary School has been, as Mrs. Saba uh, shared, one of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's expanded learning time schools since 2009. Since then, we've established the conditions, structures, and mindsets of school improvement that has supported our improved MCAS scores. Yet our percentile ranking of 10% has required us to engage in the sustainable improvement process. While many of my colleagues will be sharing their plans and processes with you, the process of the Gilmore is slightly different as a result of already being an expanded learning time school and engaging in that process. I might add that uh, the strategy for sustainable improvement outlined in DESE's guidance actually includes expanded learning time as a lever of improved change. What we hope to emphasize as being at the heart of our work and a catalyst to guiding us through improvement planning amidst a pandemic is that of our strong structures of a professional learning community. This has served as our key collaboration effort towards school improvement. Let's take a look at how we got here. Let's hope this works. At the Gilmore School, we are committed to helping students achieve their very best, every child, every day, soaring to success. Formerly the Huntington Elementary School, the Gilmore serves as the district's original turnaround school. In 2010, the efforts of strong leadership, vision, and layered initiatives over time revolutionized us into one of the early school models for the National Center for Time on Learning and Massachusetts Expanded Learning Time Schools. We were one of 16 public elementary schools in Massachusetts and one of 161 in the nation. As pioneers of this work, we joined the ELT consortium and remained dedicated to ensuring that every minute counts to provide vigorous learning opportunities for our students. All students attend school for 90 minutes over the standard elementary school day within the district. This amounts to 43 additional school days per academic year, allowing more time to close both the achievement and opportunity gaps of high needs children. Our school is uniquely situated in an urban center with a high level of transiency. Our students are 63.9% economically disadvantaged, 81.7% high needs, 53.6% first language not English, and 38.8% English language learner. These statistics do not define who we are, but rather helped us to recognize the need to establish the conditions of a school community to better serve our population. Together, we established a grassroots efforts for change. We began working collaboratively together and began to analyze all facets of our school's operations. Using the approach of America's Promise and the trauma-sensitive school's flexible framework, the entire faculty engaged in focus groups under three levers for change, culture, structure, and instruction. In each area, all members identified a common purpose to establish a safe and supportive climate for our students to thrive. Each focus group worked together through an action plan that would support our change efforts. At the core of all the work was the embedded principle of operating as a professional learning community defined by a set of norms developed by the faculty and agreed upon, and a root cause analysis of areas for improvement. Over time, we layered our initiatives through professional collaboration and professional development that would build the capacity of all stakeholders to use an inquiry-based protocol to find solutions to common areas of need. Collectively, mindsets began to shift, relationships developed, trust was built, and the culture of the school transformed as a result of a collective capacity. 
An overarching reality across all focus areas was the fact that not a single person or school can do this alone. Therefore, we sought out like-minded nonprofit social service agencies to leverage our resources. Despite the impact a transition can have on school climate and culture, the Gilmore Elementary School was able to maintain its positive climate, strong relationships with families and community members, and sustain the high quality structures for collaboration since our move from the Huntington. Branding ourselves as the Gilmore has reinvigorated our work. Despite the many challenges listed above, high quality resources coupled with professional development and collaboration has had a positive impact on our learners. As we engage in our 10th year of this work, we continue to grow and evolve. We continue to believe that investing in developing the collective capacity of our team through professional dialogue, honest self-reflection, evaluation of our practices, and at the core, a focus on supporting the whole child. Leaning in and listening closely to our families, we are cautious of our implicit bias and traditional practices so that we revise family engagement practices to better align with the community we serve. We continue to strengthen our promising partnerships to embrace the mission. It takes a flock to raise a hawk. As illustrated in the video, the Gilmore has been an expanded learning time school since 2009. During this time, we developed the conditions that set our path towards school improvement. Our professional learning community follows a protocol to analyze our goals and data to revise our practices each year. Our work required us to take the embedded practices for school improvement with ELT and view it through a lens of the four turnaround practices. The Office of Teaching and Learning was critical in this work as they served as guidance, support, and a coach to help us view our work through the lens of the four turnaround practices. Knowing that a great deal of our school improvement was much like the work we were engaged in at the Gilmore through ELT. Sometimes we are just too close to the work and it's hard to see through that very close lens. As a component of the ELT process, we have a school check-in visit every three years. We engage in an in-depth school review, very similar to what you're familiar with as the district review or what my other colleagues have shared as their TSV reports. That you have learned about in several previous meetings. During this review, it provides us with feedback on our goals, actions, and outcomes, both over time, but truly looking at only the last three years of progress. We had this site visit in January 2020. The timing was just perfect prior to our closure. Our school site visit yielded positive results across the eight conditions of effectiveness. It validated the work we had long established and strengthened over time. As you see on this screen in standards five through eight, it was clear that the culture of our school, a focus on social emotional learning, strong leadership and stakeholder feedback, but most importantly, the support of the district around our work was key to our ratings of being green or meeting expectation. I won't read those to you, but essentially in reviewing this, you can see where our highlights were. In our feedback in standards one through four, also demonstrating three meets expectation and one some improvement needed, we had structures in place that were beginning to yield results. We had some work to improve upon. This framed our areas of improvement for our SIP or our sustainable improvement plan. After determining a root cause for each set of data, the subgroups for each assessment wrote high leverage goals that included tiered coaching, learning walks, and co-teaching. Focusing on these goals, we had continued to foster ind our individual teachers' ability to develop deeper self-reflection as well as embracing professional co collaboration based on shared practices. Collaboratively, our teachers will use student data to create lessons designed to reach grade level expectations. With our ratings of meeting expectations in seven out of the eight areas and one rating of some improvement needed, you might ask yourself, why a different or another process for school improvement? This looks good. 
Well, I'll start by saying what looks good can always get better. And as a team, we always look for areas to improve. Let's take a look at the data from 2019 to 2020 that helped to inform our work. First and foremost, our accountability percentile in 2018, we were falling within the seventh percentile. In 2019, we reached the 10th percentile. DESE's criteria for need in developing a sustainable improvement plan are for schools that fall within the 10th percentile or lower. So we were right on the cusp. In addition to the findings of the site report I just shared with you, the Gilmore facilitator team, which is the anchor of our PLCs, examined access, STAR, and MCAS data. The team looked carefully at the data to identify assets and challenges for the Gilmore School. With less than 20% of all students meeting or exceeded expectations on MCAS, which is well below the state performance, our faculty recognized the school's need to narrow our focus on a common set of rigorous instructional practices and expectations for all students, including our English learners. Our root cause analysis of MCAS and access, and access and STAR also revealed the need to focus on the four domains of literacy and specifically writing. I'm going to pause here and talk simply uh, about our timeline. As I shared with you our ELT site visit report from January 30th review, uh, we received those findings, which you see in black in May of 2020. We closed for the COVID closure on March 12th, where we were supposed to have the TSV site visit from March 17th and 18th. And of course that was canceled. We were able to sustain our work as a result of our strong embedded practices around professional learning and our focus for education with our grade level teams. Uh, finally, uh, shortly before opening school, we were informed that we would experience a budget cut around our ELT funding. Um, this is approximately $650,000. Uh, and as a result of that, the cuts that we recognized and the ones that we feel were 90 minutes a day of instructional time as a loss for students, along with their enrichment blocks for our outside providers. But that also impacted our collaboration structures, which equated to three hours of professional collaboration for teachers. Well, you might be shaking your head as we did for many, um, many weeks. How are we going to continue to sustain our progress with these losses? Well, I will say I'm in awe each and every day of the collaboration among our faculty and the dedication of our families and our students with keeping the eye and lens on student learning uh, that we have been able to prevail despite the COVID closure. Let me share with you exactly what we're doing. The Gilmore has an increasing population of English learners each year. Our English language proficiency levels of newcomers through six make up 41% and an ever-growing increase of our student population. We noticed an, a, a noticeable achievement gap between our ever ELs and our non-ELs in the areas of English language arts. However, this is not as noticeable in mathematics. Uh, we decided that we were gonna focus um, and improve access and opportunities for our English learners to engage in robust, rigorous academic content, maximizing the potential growth towards our English language proficiency of our learners. We had to sit and focus on um, one essential question, uh, and that's to honor and recognize that we are amidst a global pandemic. So how are we going to ensure equitable instructional experiences that are rigorous, engaging, and culturally relevant for our students in a remote or hybrid learning model and avoid the traditional approaches of filling in gaps by assigning rudimentary tasks or year behind grade level content? That just wasn't gonna do for us. So through the process of creating a sustainable improvement plan, it gave us the opportunity to evaluate our work through the lens of the four turnaround practices. It led us on a path to determine the root cause of our stale performance. We realized that our instruction was not yielding robust student outcomes, especially for our marginalized populations. So we looked critically at our shared instructional practices, how we would use data to inform our decisions and expectations, and how we would generate problem statements that led us to the creation of our high leverage goals. This is an example of how uh, we went through the process. This is simply one of our taps. It's a summary and we have this, um, and we went through this process for tap one, two, three, and four. 
Let me illustrate for you how this work is demonstrated in action. Our current practices and area of focus this year are captured here, uh, demonstrating our high leverage goals and our strategic objectives and action steps. Each goal requires the continued and ongoing collaboration among our teacher teams and leadership structures for shared responsibilities. Here's the real work. We first and foremost always have to consider our stakeholders. So uh, our work was certainly informed by the voices of our Gilmore scholars. We developed a portrait of the Gilmore from the voices of our student council back in November, which always had um, the most passion that keeps us going, especially among COVID. Further, uh, our TAP 1 and 2 focuses on establishing clear goals and objectives for learning and making sure that our curriculum involves academic rigor. Our second action is to look at how formative assessments in our daily practice are guiding our instruction because that truly informs whether or not our highest leverage, which is teaching students, actually makes its mark. And this takes you through some of our protocols and processes. I know I'm um, cutting close to our time limit, so I am um, synthesizing at this point. Our most promising practice, which is essential to our work around our, inclus our inclusive environments is that of co-teaching and collaboration. Uh, this shows some of the evidence of how our team came together prior to the closure um, and for ongoing through the closure with our partners, uh, Andrea Honingsfeld, who is a researcher uh, through Malloy University. Um, and she has been essential to helping us uh, better understand the practices of co-teaching and the co-teaching models for which we're using to lift our focus on writing instruction. Um, in TAP 4, our specific area of focus is on developing culturally relevant uh, PBIS, positive behavior interventions and supports, uh, and focusing on social emotional learning for students. Uh, this is also led through somewhat of a co-taught model uh, by our school adjustment counselors and our PBIS leads. We're adapting the PBIS framework and lessons to represent a more culturally relevant process. Using the CASEL 5 framework, our school adjustment counselors teach lessons to each classroom using their expertise. They develop a series of lessons for each of the five core competencies through the CASEL framework, and they provide strategies and instruction. During our ELT periods, we, um, our school adjustment counselors work closely with our outside providers, specifically the YMCA, to monitor, monitor and provide similar lessons focused on self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. We've been shifting our PBIS traits from respect, responsibility, safety, kindness, and effort to our acronym SOAR to focus on safety, especially among a pandemic, ownership, and that's really understanding where they live within their learning and their present learning today and its impact on their future. Awareness, both their social awareness and their awareness in the world around diversity and inclusion. And finally, respect, which we all know is the core of um, all that we do each and every day. Um, I know that I gave you uh, some of our work more in a vacuum presentation, but essentially this flower establishes our sustainable improvement imp plan at a glance that using data informed school improvement initiatives and having student centered high quality grade level instruction for all, we will certainly bloom um, as a faculty and with student progress with uh, our five or four levers of change. And finally, um, I just want to close by saying that I know that there's a lot, there's a lot here, and it's hard to capture in 20 minutes. Um, but ultimately, each and every day, the work is so alive, even among a fully remote experience for our students, as we zoom in to each and every classroom. I am in awe each day of um, how dedicated our educators, our students and our families are with providing students with high levels of learning while they are learning themselves uh, the levels of technology and the ways to fully engage in a remote environment. Um, I do believe that our plan is guiding us through and navigating through this time and really and truly um, 
it, it, it really comes from that early video that I showed of a, of a tree, which started our work in 09, that despite the shifts of um, what can happen in a pandemic, what has prevailed through it all is really the strong teaming of professional learning communities, uh, that professional collaboration and professional development um, through all of this, and really and truly a team that understands where the work started, how far we have come, and that our work is really never done. And it's called a cycle of continuous improvement because we can always and only get better together. Thank you. Um, I just want to jump in to say, and I hope that this was really clear in um, Mary Beth's presentation that, you know, the Gilmore School was making progress. They were making steady progress despite the budget cuts, despite the turnover and staff that they've had over there. Um, they really, really were. The opportunity to work with the uh, with DESE for the uh, sustained improvement plan really gave them an opportunity to come together and bring their staff together. So many of them knew to, to really refocus and make sure that everyone has the same lens in history that um, Mary Beth and a lot of her staff who have remained over the years have been so entrenched in. And I'm sure it's clear by now, um, Mary Beth knows this plan inside and out, but so does her staff. This is not the, the, the Mary Beth O'Brien plan. This is the Gilmore School's plan. And if you talk to any of their staff, um, they are a model for this district as far as the collaboration. Um, and, and we often tap into, no pun intended, tap into the, the staff at the Gilmore School because they, um, they really do lead the charge in this. And they're not just at the Gilmore, they share their practice with others, they're collaborative across the district. Um, and so you just need to know that the Gilmore is in, in very good hands with the leadership and the, the collaboration of their staff. Um, is there any question or comment from the members of the committee? Looks like Mr. Sullivan, I see Mrs. Sullivan. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Sullivan. You're muted, can't hear you. Tim, Tim, you're muted. Can you hear me now? There we go. Uh, sorry. No worries. I had the mute off. I just wanted to say, Ms. O'Brien, it was a great presentation. And I can't believe how far you've come during this pandemic trying to, uh, just to teach the kids. I can't believe it. You're doing a fabulous job. I just wanted to commend you and your staff. It looks like it's a great, great procedure you're doing. And keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. I believe Mrs. Sullivan, you had a hand up. Yes, I just wanted to thank Mary Beth for a very complete presentation. Mm -hmm. I know the Gilmore School is a special place, and she's a very good principal. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Um, all right. If there's no other comment from members of the committee, I'm going to jump in. Anybody else before I do that? Okay. Um, so just a couple of things that I wanted to say that kind of jumped out at me during your presentation. First of all, it's nice to see you again. I know we used to work together a lot more when you were the Huntington School, um, and, and I definitely miss that. Um, so the, some of what you commented on, you commented on how the demographics basically, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, but you, you made the comment, don't define who we are, which I think is really important that not only that you've said that, but that, that you live that in, in the school, because it really is important that that doesn't define who anybody is and who the school is. Um, you know, another thing, and, I, and we've talked about this before, again, back in the old Huntington days, you know, where you revised, you and your team revised um, your family engagement, um, ways of doing that um, to align with the families that you serve. And, and we've talked about that before. And I've um, always been uh, appreciative of the fact that you've, you know, thought outside the box and looked for different ways to create um, more ability for families to engage. Um, so, and then uh, obviously, you know, you've achieved a lot of great results. Um, 
And uh, so I applaud you and the entire staff and team over at the Gilmore. You've done some great things. Um, and and what, I, what I appreciate too is while we're celebrating the, the accomplishments, also acknowledging, but hey, there's still um, you know, room for improvement and that's great. Um, you know, that there's still always that, that look for how can we, you know, we're doing good, but how can we do even better? And I, I really uh, appreciated that, the, that part of your, uh, your comments. And, and, and finally, um, again, there was another comment that was, and again, I apologize because I'm not paraphrasing very well um, what you had said, but, um, you know, just that uh, there was at one point you had talked about with COVID and um, what you'd be able to do and, and you and your staff just said, you know what, that's not good enough. That's not, you know, enough for, for the kids and you pushed yourselves to, to do even better. And, you know, I certainly applaud that and appreciate that. And um, of course, you know, I'm not surprised at all, um, you know, by that uh, approach by, by the uh, staff at the Gilmore, because again, you know, from when it was the Huntington, I know that that's been the approach for, for a long time. And uh, you've continued that and, and uh, the staff has continued that. And so um, you're doing a great job. Everybody at the Gilmore is doing a great job and I uh, really appreciate all of their, their efforts. So. Any, Thank you. You're welcome. Any other uh, comments from the, from the members of the committee? I also want to thank uh, Principal O'Brien and, and Heather um, June. Thanks for being here to do the presentation. Again, very informative. And I really thank you and your staff and the teams you have working um, for all the hard work. Um, I see the plans that go into the Department of Ed. I know how much time the Department of Ed spends with you and how much time you and your team and staff spend on this. So we really appreciate your hard work and your dedication and commitment to this work. Thank you very much. All right. If there's nothing else for uh, Principal O'Brien and um, um, Heather Ronan, um, then I guess we'll um, move to uh, other business. Is there any other business to come before the curriculum subcommittee? Uh, Mr. DiAugustino, I have um, just a quick update. Um, and I just, as, as um, Mr. DiAugustino is uh, uh, a parent of a kindergarten student. So um, we are still, um, you know, we've gone back and forth on uh, the kindergarten plan as, you know, a uh, plan to get the students off the computer. Um, but we want to take into consideration parents who have set up their schedule um, and now, uh, you know, in, in a routine of being logged on by 9, 9.15. Um, so we are going to uh, continue to talk um, work with, uh, through negotiations, work with um, the Office of Teaching and Learning and, uh, you know, elementary staff, uh, teachers and, and administrators to uh, look at the day um, and how the day is structured for kindergarten students and continue to look at that and, um, you know, uh, see the way, the best practices that are being used uh, to keep kids, you know, get kids away from the computer without maybe disrupting the start time for parents. Um, so we're going to continue to work on that and we'll report back to the school committee. Uh, however, on Monday, um, we had to redo the, the schedules of the specialists. Uh, and one way to get the students away from the computer is there'll be some um, optional asynchronous, um, you know, and it's, it's only optional for kindergarten students because, again, they're not tied to time on learning, but there'll be asynchronous specialist uh, um, lessons for you know, phys ed, art, music, health. Um, and that's a way for parents to um, use those um, asynchronous lessons that, at, you know, times that work for them and uh, times that work for the teachers to get the students away from the computer. So uh, that will start on Monday and the elementary principals will, um, if they haven't already inform parents about that. And um, so I just wanted to give the, the committee an update on the work around the kindergarten schedule. Great. Any questions for the superintendent on the kindergarten schedule? No. All right. Uh, any other curriculum business to come before the curriculum subcommittee? All right. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 
All right, we have a motion to adjourn by uh, Ms. Asak, properly seconded by Mr. Sullivan. I will call the roll. Uh, Mayor Sullivan. Yes. All right, and D'Agostino is a yes. Um, Ms. Azak? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Mendez? Yes. Mr. Minicello? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. All right, we are adjourned. We'll, we'll uh, come back at 6.15 for our policy subcommittee meeting. See you all in a few minutes. Thank you.